All right, welcome back. So, today, our journey with objects continues, and we're going to talk about one of the defining features about how we establish new types in Java, using the Java object system. Java organizes objects into a hierarchy that allows them to share um, parts of their state and behavior with other classes. And this gives us a really nice new way to design um, you know, different types using Java classes to represent different types of information that are related to each other. So we don't have to keep repeating ourselves all over the place. We can build you know, classes that represent a certain type of data and then subclasses of those classes that represent slight modifications to that original type of data. Right? So we'll start talking about that today. We're also going to do a little bit of review of static. But the first thing I wanted to do is just talk a little bit about the midterm. So um, you guys did well on the midterm. I, I was happy overall with the, with the summary scores. Um, the, the programming questions that did not appear on the homework already are now on the homework problem set, so you can look at those, and I would encourage you to do that. Um, so let me talk a little bit about how to interpret your result on the midterm, because again, the primary goal of this is not to rank you into groups or not to discourage you from continuing to pursue computer science. Um, it's to give you a sense of where you are in the class and how well you know, the things that you've been doing are working. Um, because as we go on, these imperative programming and building blocks are really important. We're going to continue to use them as we talk about objects, when we implement simple object methods and, and build our own classes. MP2, which will be out today, is certainly not the um, mess of working with 2D arrays that MP1 is, but it still does continue to build on those imperative programming building blocks that we've been talking about for the last month. So, when you think about your own midterm score, I would think primarily about, you know, how did you fare on the programming questions? Those are the, those are the ones that, that I see as more indicative of, of how you're doing in the class. If you got all of them, great. You're doing great. Whatever it is you're doing, keep it up, because it's working. If you got two out of three, you know, okay. Um, you know, maybe you missed the last one. That one was, you know, a little bit trickier than the other two, although certainly not, you know, out of bounds from what we expect you to do. Um, but, you know, the other thing I would, I would point out is whatever you're doing, um, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't lose that intensity. Don't lose that uh, preparation. Um, it, it worked okay. Um, you're going to need to continue doing that throughout the rest of the semester to be successful. This is a sort of a, you know, I, I know the last week was tough with the midterm and MP1, you know, keeping you guys busy. Um, this is kind of a, an interesting moment in the semester because we sort of, uh, we're sort of resetting, right? So we sort of finished up imperative stuff. You know, MP1 is really kind of the last big push on that. You guys will be turning in today. Um, and then as we start to talk about objects, you know, the homework gets simpler again and stuff like that. But, you know, we're, we're going to ramp up again quickly. So within a couple of weeks, we'll be showing you some new things about objects that are going to get confusing. So this is not the time in the semester to think, oh, phew, you know, I made it. Um, you did make it this far, which is fantastic, but, you know, keep up the hard work um, and, and certainly keep space in your schedule to continue to, to devote time to this class. All right, if you, if you couldn't do two of the problems, now, you know, it really depends on, on what happened. And feel free to come by, talk to me. Today is not the best day. Uh, because we're focused on getting MP1 done, but certainly if you want to come in on, on Wednesday or Friday to my office hours and, and we can look over your midterm together. Um, if, you, if you almost got one of the problems, maybe you made a silly mistake, okay, fine. Um, but if you were really flummoxed by two out of the three programming questions, then I'm concerned about where you are in the class right now um, and how well you're going to do going forward. Um, if you didn't get any, you know, uh, please talk to a core staff member. This is the problem. You, you are not ready to move on. Questions about midterm results? Anything else that's going on sort of right about now? How to interpret your midterm? Any of the questions on the midterm? Again, the questions on the midterm are on the, have been released. They're the, two of the example questions, there were a couple different variants of those questions. So you might have seen the one that we put on the problem set. You might have seen a slightly different one. Um, questions about? Yeah. 2%. Yeah, so the question was, how much weight does the midterm have on the grade? Um, the, the three midterms together are worth 6% of your grade, so the first one is, is worth 2%. Um, you know, right now, that first one is, is essentially covering the entire 
um, the entire space of that 6%, but as you take the second midterm and then the third midterm, um, that, that, that'll fill in. Yeah. I want to remind you, there's no exam for this class. Um, and, you know, let, let me point something out. So 2% so doesn't sound like a lot, and, and that's okay. That's sort of intentional. Um, the, the way that we structure this class, we want to reward people who put the time and energy in every single week. This is not um, a topic. This is not a skill. You can't do this with a skill. There's no cramming, right? You can't cram and suddenly learn how to play the piano overnight. You have to do it every single day. Same thing with, you know, learning how, you know, getting in better shape or learning how to speak a new language or something like that. There's, there's no cramming for this stuff. And so the way that we've structured the assessments for the class is designed to reflect that. However, just one of, this is a good point that, you know, in the semester to have this conversation. I want to remind you that um, there's no magic way to save yourself coming later. Right? In some classes, it's like, oh, I'm not doing very well, but there's a final that's worth 50% of my grade. And so if I just really study for that final and stock up on the Red Bull and whatever else you guys use to study, um, you know, maybe I can still do okay. I've taken classes like that. But that's not the way this class works. You know, at this point in the semester, we're about a third done, and a third of your grade is in the books. You know? and, and pretty much the rest of it comes out doled out in small increments. So there's no big high-stakes assessment waiting at the end of the semester that's suddenly going to, to, to make everything work. Other questions? Anything, anything at all? Anything that's on your mind? You know, anything you guys want to want to bring up at this point? Yeah. 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 The, so MP2 will come out today. It's going to be a two-weeker. Um, I think after MP1, you will find this one to be a bit of a break. Um, it's certainly not as fiddly as MP1 is. Um, it's more conceptual. People do struggle on it, but there's, you know, uh, the code that you have to write is actually simpler once you figure out what to do. After MP2, we have uh, MP3, our fourth MP, which will be come out right before break. When we get back from break, we're really almost home free MP-wise. Um, we have uh, MP4, which is a fantastic MP, and you guys are going to love. Um, obviously, I'm smiling diabolically there. Um, and then MP5 is the final project. Oh, I wanted to say something about that, because I think it's a good time to, to bring this up, since you got sort of a rough week, maybe, last week. Um, we're making preparations for the final project fair in the class, which is my favorite part of the class and something that's, that's really cool and exciting. Um, one of the things that we're having a lot of luck with, and I, want, I just want to put this on your radar screen, is we have, um, we've reached out to a bunch of companies for corporate sponsorship, and we've gotten some good replies about that. Um, we may also have local companies that have representatives that are going to be coming to the final project fair to look at the kind of work you guys are doing. So keep this in mind as we continue to try to show you how to do these little pieces of Android on each assignment, because that's going to come in really handy when you work on the final project. And, and trust me, this is the number one way to impress uh, employers and get a job, is to do something independent. We're, we don't give you any structure on the final project. We just say go. Build something cool. Um, that's exactly the type of thing that employers are looking for. They don't care what you did on an assignment for a class. You know, we told you what to do. We gave you a lot of starter code and stuff like that. But if you can build something from scratch that shows your passion for technology and your ability to learn new things and you know, cobble something together and work with other people's code and use existing libraries so that you can quickly put together something that's pretty cool, that is something that every employer wants. So we will have, you know, we, we had this last semester. I think we'll do a better job this semester. We'll have some local, you know, employers at the project fair um, looking at what you guys have done. And they, they are certainly, they were very impressed last semester. I'm sure they will be equally impressed this semester. So this is sort of like something to look forward to and something to keep in mind as, as you work on the MPs, particularly as you work on the Android bits of the MPs. Those are all there to, to lay the groundwork so that you can do a, an awesome final project. Cool. Okay. So... Let's talk about a little bit about static, go back and, and review. We, we covered this quickly at the end of class last time. So we've been talking about how to use Java classes uh, to create new types that allow us to model different types of data. Java classes combine state and behavior. Typically, when I create a new Java class, each instance of that class has its own state. So if I have a person class, each person that I create using a new keyword has its own name and age and any other variables that I might add in as well. Static, on the other hand, when I put a static keyword on either a variable or a method, 
then I get different behavior for that piece of state or that piece of behavior, for that function or for that variable. That function or variable now belongs to the class, not to a specific instance of the class. So this means a couple of things. First of all, I can access it before creating an instance. So here's an example where I have both a static variable and a static method. My static method is called print name. And you'll see down here that I can call print name. There's new, there's no new keyword anywhere. I haven't created an instance of a course, but I can still call print name. The way I do that is I use the name of the class and then I use the dot notation and the name of the static method that I want to call. So I don't need an instance to call a static function. I can do the same thing with the variable, right? So I've, I've declared a public static int, and I can modify that variable without having an instance of the object. However, this also means that uh, static methods can't, I don't think this is on the slide, can't actually use any instance variables that are defined. Um, on, on the class, because I don't have, so essentially you can think of it this way, this is not defined inside a static method. I've got, I have no instance of the object that's currently running that method, and so I can't access any instance variables or call any instance methods. All right, so I can also call static methods if I have an instance of the object. So here I'm using um, the notation where I use the name of the class, to call the static method using dot notation. Down here, I've created a new instance of the course um, type called CS125, and I can also access the static method using that instance. So if I have an instance of the class, I can still call static methods using the dot notation, but I don't need an instance of the class to do that. You can see that on line nine. So I think I just said these things. So, like I said, static methods can't use this, right? So, so here's an example where I'm mixing instance variables that belong to an instance of this particular type of Java object, in this case, I'm called in this class course again. So every course, every individual course has a name that's of type string. But because I've uh, created the print name method as static, I can't access this dot name, and even if I just use name, I can't access name because I can call that method without providing an instance of the object. So the fact that I can do um, this on line nine, right? So when I call course.printName here, there's no instance of course that I've created. And so, you know, there, there's no uh, instance of course, meaning there's no name. And so I can't use the name inside the static. Static variables, one of those danger, danger zone things, are shared between all instances of the class. I know I'm repeating myself here, but I think this is important to cover because this is a tricky concept that tends to, tends to trip people up a little bit. So here I have a static, I've created a, a variable on my class, but I've marked it as static. And so if I don't mark it as static, every course has its own count. But if I do mark it as static, all instances of the course share the same count. And so if I change the count, it's visible to all instances of the course. So I create two instances here, two different courses. Um, now I increment the count static variable that's shared among all of them. And when I print it, they're both going to print one. So that static variable is now shared among everybody. I can use public and private the way I would normally on instance variables and methods, on static variables and methods as well. And they work pretty much how I would expect. This is also a good chance for us to review our visibility modifiers. So if I put public on a static method, that method can be used by anybody. If I mark it as uh, private, that static method can only be called by other methods on that class. Same thing with variables. If I put public on a static variable, anybody can, can modify it, uh, read or write it. If I mark it as private, it can only be modified by methods that run on that class. All right, I just said this. So one of the things that you, you can, and I just want to show you this because it's a common pattern, and this is something that we'll have you do for MP2. One of the things you can use static to do is you can use static to get around this problem that we had before. So remember, when we were uh, looking at constructors, we had this case where 
we wanted a constructor to be able to fail if I gave it invalid inputs. So if I call a constructor and I give it, you know, invalid values, I want that constructor to be able to fail somehow so that the caller knows that it doesn't have a valid instance of the object. But based on what we know at this point, constructors can't fail. They always return a new instance of the object. So I can set it up, I can initialize the fields and things like that, but I can't fail. There's no way, a constructor doesn't return. I don't explicitly return anything, so I can't return null. And again, using the, the features of Java that we know about so far, there's no way to fail. That'll change in a little bit when we talk about errors, but for now, a constructor is always gonna return a new instance of that type of object. So, how do I get around this problem? Let's say I wanna make sure that when somebody creates a new instance of a particular type of class, they've actually provided uh, reasonable arguments. And so what I can do is I can do, uh, this is sometimes called a factory method or a static object creation method. Um, I can create a static method on the class that acts a lot like a constructor, but that static method can return null if I provide invalid arguments. So let's see how to do this. So this was our example from before, where I had a storage class that I was creating, um, and I had my storage constructor that took an argument that was supposed to indicate how many, um, how many ints this was going to store, and then I used this to initialize my internal array, okay? So, how can this go wrong? So it's possible for me to provide invalid values to this constructor, and it's not clear what to do. What, what are some invalid values that I could provide here that don't make sense? Yeah. Yeah, like a negative value. What does it even mean, right? What does it mean to store negative integers? It's like I take them out of the universe or something? It's like, the, like an antiparticle for storage. Um, no, so the negative values clearly don't make any sense. What's another value that doesn't make any sense? Remember, we, we, the way that we had uh, defined this, it wasn't gonna allow the number of integers it stored to change later. And so what's another value that I might want to reject? Well, I've got an int here, so that's a good point. I'm not gonna get floating point values because I've defined the argument as an int. But what's another value that just like doesn't, doesn't lead to a very useful instance of the storage class? I can think of a couple, actually. Yeah. Oh, can, can an int be null? Yeah, so I can't pass null to this uh, constructor because it takes an int, right? And, and the primitive types in Java uh, don't allow me to, to, to pass null. I can only use null where I would get an object. But again, what's another unhelpful value here? Yeah. Zero. I don't want to create a storage class that stores nothing, right? I would also argue there's another not that useful value. Yeah. Yeah, one, like why create a storage class to store one int? You know, just use an int, you know, use a, a local variable. But let's just reject values that are less than, less than or equal to zero for now. So how am I gonna do this? So let me create a new method. Um, this is a static method, right? Now, this is important. There's no way to create this as an instance method because then in order to call it, I would need an instance. If I create it as a static method, now, I can call it just by uh, having the class, right? So this is a way um, that I'm gonna uh, use to create a constructor-like function that allows, uh, that, that can fail. So this function is gonna return um, a new instance of a storage, of the storage class. Okay, so I've marked that as public. I want everybody to be able to use this. I marked it as static. This is uh, a function that does not require an instance of the class to run. I've called it create, you know, I could call it create instance or whatever, but create is fine. It takes the same argument as the constructor, but what can I do here that I can't do in the constructor? Somebody write a little bit of this code for me. Help me out here. What can I do to, yeah. Yeah, so I'm gonna check to see if the size is okay. And I just decided that I'm gonna reject values that are less than or equal to zero. Otherwise, I'm gonna return, essentially I'm just gonna call the constructor and create a new object using that size. 
but what do I do if set size is invalid? So if it's valid, I'm gonna return a new instance, so that's acting very much like the constructor would act. But if it's invalid, what do I do? Yeah. Return null, yeah. So that's the thing that constructor can't do. So I'm gonna say here, return null. So now down here, um, let's create a, a new instance of the storage class, and I'm gonna use this storage.create, um, and let's pass zero, make sure that this works. Yeah, so now if I pass it an invalid value, and I can use negative values here as well, right, I get, um, I get, and, and if I don't, I get a valid storage reference. And, and we're gonna talk a little bit about why this prints this uh, a little bit later today, but also uh, later in the class as well. But, but essentially, um, may, maybe here's the right way to do this. Instead of printing off the storage object, which doesn't print something very useful, I'll just print if it's null, right? So let's make sure this is working. So if I call create with zero, I should get null. If I call create with a negative value, I should get null. If I call create with a positive value, I should get a non-null storage object that I can then use once we added methods and stuff like that. I can also, in, in my uh, create method, I could also set a maximum size. Maybe I don't wanna make these too big. Um, so I could say, you know, uh, make sure that the size is also less than some, some maximum that I set. Um, but, I, but I can do this. So there's, there's also, so there's, there's one problem here, though, with what we've done. And we can solve this problem, but what, so far, this is looking pretty good. But what would I like to be able to do here to kind of finish the job? You know, so the goal here is to kind of like uh, prevent people from being able to create storage instances with invalid values. Am I doing that yet? I'm close. I'm not quite there. Yeah. Yeah, I still got the constructor line around. And so there's, there's no way, you know, let's say that somebody doesn't read the documentation. I know you guys would never do that. Um, but, you know, let's say that somebody does this. Now I've got the problem that I was trying to avoid. So someone can still call my constructor, and now I've got this negative array size exception because I've tried to create an array with negative size. And even Java knows that that's a bad idea. So, anyone know how to fix this? Interesting combination of things that we've already seen. Yeah. Ah, yeah, can I, can I use a visibility modifier on a constructor? Turns out I can. So I can mark my constructor as private. This is really interesting. Normally, it doesn't make any sense to mark a constructor as private because then how does someone create an instance of your new class? But here, because I pri provided this create method for you, I can now force the uh, user to not call the constructor directly. So there is now no way to call the constructor on this class. So I can't create a new instance using new. Don't do this unless you provide an alternative. In our case, we did provide an alternative, and the alternative is to call storage.create. Now, why does this work? So note that I'm still calling the constructor, right? I'm calling the constructor right here on line 10 when I find that the set size is valid. Why is that okay? Good review of visibility modifiers. Why is it, why does this still work? This will work. You try it. So let's make sure that this still works. Yep, good. But why is this okay? Why can create call the constructor? But I can't in my main method on the example class where this code starts to run. Yeah, the same class, bingo. Private means that the method can only be used by other methods on the same class. That's true for constructors as well. So essentially what happens is, when I call create, I start executing a method that's defined on the storage class. Once I do that, that method can call other private methods and do whatever it wants. It can modify private variables, you know, it can go to town. And so it is allowed to use the private constructor. Anyway, this is a pattern that you see, you know, in certain Java libraries to prevent people from constructing uh, new instances of the class incorrectly. So I've still got a way 
to get a new storage instance, but I can't pass invalid values or I get a null, a null result. Questions about this before we go on? There's a couple of things mixed in here that are important to understand. Yeah. No, okay, great question. So the question is, can I get rid of the private storage constructor? If I did that, how would I create a new instance of storage? Yeah, it's a good question. If I want to create a new object in Java, I always have to use the new keyword, and I need a constructor. Now, what I've shown you here is the case where the constructor is not visible to the outside world. So if you created this and you published this online, nobody would know that your class had a constructor, but it always has to have a constructor. If you want to create instances of a class, it has to have a constructor. Um, it, it soon, so the other thing I want to point out, which is interesting here, people, people might say, well, can't I, re remember that if I didn't call, if I didn't define a constructor, there was still a default constructor, right? So can I do something like this? try to create a new storage, okay? So there's, oh, this is a separate problem, right? Yeah, okay. So if I don't provide a constructor for a class, I get a default public constructor that takes no arguments. But as soon as you define a constructor for a class, that default constructor doesn't get used anymore. So the fact that I've defined a constructor here, even though it's private, means that I can no longer call this uh, the default constructor anymore. So if, if I don't provide a constructor, I get this default constructor that doesn't do any setup for me. As soon as I provide a, any constructor, even if that constructor is private, I no longer have access to that default constructor. So this is nice, because essentially, by providing this private constructor, I can ensure that people create instances of my class in exactly the way that I want. Good question. Other questions about this? Again, this feels like kind of a random example, but there's a lot of important concepts here from the last week that are built into this. We've got a constructor. We've got a static method. Um, we've got some visibility modifiers here and there to, to control access to our class. Um, and, and we've got, you know, little bits of imperative programming, as we, as we still do. Okay, let's go on. Brief, so, so the... the you know, this part of the class always feels to me like sort of a Java keyword bingo, right? So you can now fill in final on your bingo card um, because we're talking about keywords in Java and final is one of them. And final is actually really easy to talk about. There's two slides on this. I want to mention this because you do see it and it's important. So if I mark a variable as final, and we're only going to talk about marking variables as final, final also has a meaning when it's applied to a method or a function as well, but it's most often seen used on variables, or that's what we're going to talk about. When I mark a variable as final, it means that that variable's value cannot be modified. And so this is most commonly used to establish constants. You have seen this on, I think we, we did this on MP0. Definitely did it on MP1. You may see it, I don't, I don't think we have any on MP2. Um, so here's an example of how to create a constant in Java. This is a symbolic constant. So what I'm doing here, and this is the way to get around those check style magic number errors. This is the right way to do it. Um, and, and this is, you know, this is sort of like the epitome of Java, Java, Java keywords, right? So here I've got a public static final int. So what does that mean? Okay. Public. That means that anybody can read or write it, except that it's final, which means that I can't modify it. So anybody can only read it. Static, there's only one version of this, and that makes, it almost always makes sense to mark a, fi a constant value as static because you don't need, you know, you know it's never going to change. So there's no reason to make a copy of it per instance. So I've got a public uh, variable of type int. I marked it as static, so there's only one copy associated with the class, and final, it cannot be changed. When you do this, Check style and Java convention indicates that you use a different naming convention for the variable's name. Again, you've seen this already, and, and check style may have yelled at you for this. All capitals with um, underscores between, um, between words instead of camel case, right? So we normally do camel case, which you guys have seen and are probably used to. Um, 
there's probably a name for this, but I don't know what it is. Um, but you can see, you know, you can still separate words using underscores. Everything is all in caps. The reason for this is when you see this in your code, you know that that's a constant value. Why use a symbolic constant like this in your code? Why not use the, just use the value eight? Why, why, why does this, why is this, uh, why does Chexel complain about magic numbers? Uh, why is this useful? Yeah. Yeah, so one really good reason for this is that if I ever want to change hours per night, like let's say that research shows that you actually should get nine hours of sleep per night, right? And I don't want to like go through my app and find every place where I put eight. I just change it to nine right here and then everything else works. So that's one really important reason. What's another important reason? Re this, yeah. Yeah, so if, if I'm just reading your code and you to, like you set this variable to eight, I'm like, why? I mean, I like the number eight quite a bit. It's, probably, it's my favorite number, but I, I probably wouldn't assume that you would have set a variable to eight because it's my favorite number. I'm probably thinking, what, what does that mean? But if I see hours per night, and I'm like, oh, okay, I understand, right? Um, so by creating a symbolic constant, you take out a meaningless value like eight or 10.5 or, or a string, and you replace it with a constant that's technically a variable, but now has a, a meaningful name. Right, and that helps people who are looking at your code understand what you're trying to do, right? So two super important reasons. One, it's easier to change later. The second is that it's much more readable. And this is why check style enforces this. For pretty much every um, magic value other than a couple that are very common, like one and zero and stuff like that. Those appear a lot in loops, right? So if you, if, if, if I guess we could make, I mean, if, if check style forced you to define zero as a constant, I think you would be angry. Um, because again, it gets used in a lot of, uh, Loop initialization. All right. You can't change a final value. You can, you can try in our little examples, but it doesn't work. Um, so here's an example. I've, I've set this to eight. It's never going to change, right? I can reassign it. I'm not even sure that the normal Java compiler will you allow you to reassign a final variable. I think it, it will fail at the compiler stage with an error message. Um, because once I've marked a variable as final, I should never assign it, right? It only gets assigned in the initialization and then never change. Okay, so we can cross final off of our bingo card. Any questions about these two new, two new keywords? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, great question. So. Uh, the, the question is, does the order of the visibility modifiers, and, and I, I would call them keywords, right? So if I look over here at this initialization, I have a type, a name, and my uh, initialization, and then I've got this whole keyword thing going over here. And I think, I'm trying to think. I think you can get up to like four or five keywords in Java, right? It really can go a little insane. Um, does the order matter? No. Um, however, there is a standard ordering and if you get it wrong, check style will complain. And I think uh, Android Studio will also point out. So there's a, there's a standard ordering um, that you sort of get used to seeing. Uh, the, the public or private typically comes first. Um, static fits in there if needed. Final comes after static. And so, so there's, a, there's a canonical ordering of those keywords. So you typically see them in the same order when they're all present. But the order doesn't matter. A public final static variable is the same thing as a static final public variable. Good question. Other questions about these, yeah. Mm hmm Yeah, so the, so the question is, how, how do I use it? So in, if, if, if in my code, let's say I have a bunch of places where I'm, I have an app that's essentially encouraging somebody to get the right amount of sleep, right? And I've got a bunch of places where I want to either tell them how much sleep they're supposed to get or check to see if they got enough or whatever, right? If I use hours per night every time I'm checking to see if an amount is the right amount of sleep, then later if I go back and change that to nine, everything still works. Does that make sense? So for example, I might have a screen that says you're supposed to get hours per night of sleep. Right now that's eight. If I change it to nine, now it prints nine. I might have a piece of code somewhere that calculates how much sleep somebody got and says if it's 
you know, greater than or equal to hours per night, you got enough sleep. If it's not, you need to get more sleep, right? If I change, if I use hours per night there, and I change hours per night later to nine, then that still works, right? So as long as I use this, now, if I start using eight all over the place, I don't get the benefit. I have to use the concept, right? I have to use it in order for that to work. Yeah, question? Yeah, whenever, whenever I have a final variable, there's no reason to have a copy of it per instance, right? This also allows me to use it um, outside of the, the class. So a lot of times, classes provide these sort of constants. So for example, I might want to say something like, example, uh, if, you know, sleep is greater than example dot hours per night, you know, do something, right? So I don't want to associate it with a particular. Yeah, the question was why make this static? Good questions. Okay, let's, let's go for, uh, ooh, look at this. I didn't realize I could do that. It's not very useful, but kind of weird. All right. All right. So now I want to pose a puzzle to you. Actually, I have a really fun lab we're doing for this week where you guys are going to get to solve some more code-related puzzles. But this is a different kind of puzzle. Okay. I've got an example class here. And I've got a static method on it called main that's going to be run when I run this piece of code. But here's what I want to know. Why does this code work? It will. The output doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. But it doesn't crash. And it does print something. So what I want to know is why. So why shouldn't this work? Someone tell me that. So I've got this class example. How many methods have I declared on this class? One. One static method called main. That's, remember, with our slide examples now, that's where we start running the code. But wait, I see something weird. What is weird about this? What is unex, unex, there's something inexplicable about this example. There's something here that should not work. And yet does. What is that? Yeah. Well, that's okay. So I don't, remember, I don't have to provide a constructor. So I'm just using the default constructor there. That's fine, right? But we're getting warmer. Again, if I just showed you this, knowing what you know so far, there's something weird here. Yeah. Yeah. What is going on on line five? So I've got an instance of example. Okay. I know if I don't provide a constructor, I get the default constructor. So that's fine. That's why I can create a new instance of this example. But where is the toString method that's being run here? I'm using dot notation to call a method called toString. But I don't see that. Do you see that method defined somewhere? It's like five lines of code here, plus braces. What is going on? I think the people with their hands up know what the answer is, but let's, let's talk about it. So this is one of the central features. The reason this works is because one of the central features of Java's object system, Java's type system. Java allows objects to inherit state and behavior from another class. So let's look at this example. I have a class at the top called pet. And this is a class that looks pretty familiar to us. It declares one instance method called print me that um, is of type void but print some stuff to the console. And then I've got two instance variables called name and type. And I'm using this protected keyword for the first time, and we'll come back and talk about why that is in a second. But now on line nine, I have some new syntax. So you can fill out another spot on your Java keyword bingo. I've got this extends. I've never seen this before. So line nine, public class dog. So, so far I'm good. I know what that means. I'm declaring a new type called dog. And based on the name of that type, it sounds like that type's going to store some information about a dog. But extends pet. So there's, my, there, there's the Java keyword that establishes an inheritance relationship between these two classes. So what does this mean? This means that my class dog is now going to inherit state and behavior from pet. 
We have terminology that we use to talk about these, and this is something that we're going to be talking about, you know, for the next couple classes. So, for example, I can create a new dog down here, and I can call print me. Now, this is weird, because dog provides a constructor that takes a name and, a t and it takes a name and it sets a type, but it does not provide a print me method, nor does it provide name or type variables. So the dog class that I've just declared doesn't have a name, doesn't have a type. They're not declared within its declaration. The reason it can access these is because it's extending its parent class, in this case, which is pet. So you can sort of think of when I use the extends keyword, I now am able, I'm borrowing all of the state and behavior from pet, and I'm adding stuff to it. I'm extending an existing class. So I'm taking the pet class, which has a name and a type, and a function called print me. And in this case, all I'm adding is a constructor, but I can use the variables on the class that I'm extending, and I can also call the methods on the class that I'm extending, assuming that their, their, uh, their visibility modifiers are set up properly. So we'll see this in a second. So in Java, we establish this relationship using this extends keyword. In Java, a class extends, can extend one other class. That's it. There are languages like Python, I think, where you can actually extend multiple classes. Java does not allow this. Uh, multiple class extension creates some issues when we start to try to figure out which methods to run. So in Java, ooh, this is not allowed. Um, so every, uh, every class can extend zero or one class. Um, and I can have multiple classes that extend the same parent. So in this case, I've got a dog class that extends pet. And I've got a cat class that extends pet. So dog inherits state and behavior from pet. Cat also inherits state and behavior from pet. We have terminology for this. We refer to um, the parent as the class that's being extended. So dog's parent is now pet. Cat's parent is now pet. We can also go the other direction. We can talk about um, descendants or children. We can say that both dog and cat are children of the pet class because they extend. Now, again, in this case, this is kind of a silly example. All these classes are empty, but this is just to show you the terminology. Okay. We can have multiple levels of inheritance. In Java, classes can extend classes that extend other classes. So in this case, I've got a pet class. On line two, I'm extending, I'm uh, declaring a dog class that extends pet, so it's going to inherit state and behavior from pet. And then on line three, I have a mutt class that extends dog. So mutt now inherits state and behavior from dog and state and behavior from pet. Dog inherits state and behavior from pet. So I inherit the state and behavior of all of my ancestors, all the classes above me. So anything that I add to pet will be usable in both dog and mutt. Anything that I add to dog will be usable in mutt. Anything that I add to mutt will only be usable in mutt. Yeah, sorry. Ah, great question. So uh, the question is, will private variables also be accessible? No. Right? And we'll, we'll come and we'll talk about how those visibility modifiers work in a minute. Yeah. If I mark something private, it's only available on that class. Yeah. It's a good question. Okay. So let's talk a little bit. We, we, before we talked about visibility modifiers, I said we had public, we had private, and there, was a, there, were, there were two more, actually. And one of them is called protected. The idea behind a protected variable. So let's, let's now distinguish about how these work. So public... A public variable, for example, anybody can read or write, can see and set, right? They can use the variable any way they want. A private variable is only accessible on that class, okay? So even its descendants don't have access to that. A protected variable is supposed to be accessible to the class and to its descendants. So if I mark something as protected, it means that not everybody can use it, just classes that extend me 
or extend uh, classes that extend me. Any class that is lower than me on the class hierarchy can use that value. So public, anybody can read or write. Private, only methods defined on that class, not its descendants, can use that value. Protected variable can only be read or written by methods defined on that class or its descendants. All right, so but here's an example. Um, this is the, the one I just showed you a minute ago. So now I'm, I'm running this main method. I'm creating a new dog named Choo Choo. Um, Choo Choo sets its own name and its type. These are variables that are not defined on the dog class. They're defined on the pet class. And they're marked as protected. If I mark this as private, what's going to happen? So now, I have an error. Because what happens is dog is now trying to set a variable that's marked as private in the pet class. I'm not allowed to do that. So if I mark, if I set this back to protected, then this example is going to work again. So protected means that I can modify those variables, any methods, um, on, defined on that class or on its descendants. So the descendants in this case is, is dog. So protected, um, if you fiddle around with this a little bit, and I'm, I'm not gonna spend very really much time here, uh, you'll find out that protected doesn't seem to work exactly how you would expect. Um, and this is because, so this will actually work, right? In fact, I, I can do it right over here, right? So I've got example, let's set choo-choo.name is equal to Ziz, this is Ziz, yeah. So you might wonder, like, wait, you just said that wouldn't work. Because example is not related to pet. So why does this work? It works because the rules about protected are a little bit more complicated. So protected means that the variable can be read or written by a class's uh, descendants, any class that extends that class, or anybody in the same package. And we haven't talked about packages, we may not this semester. Uh, this is a way of organizing Java code that is not particularly uh, interesting um, to, to discuss in class, but I just wanna point this out in case you're confused about how protected works. But the idea is, if somebody in another piece of code extends my class, marking a variable is protected means that they can modify. Okay, so. Just to finish up today, we're obviously gonna come back and talk a lot more about inheritance, just introducing this idea. It's not on this week's quiz, don't worry about that. Um, but let me just go through quickly how the, the visibility modifiers work as a summary. So public variables, read or written by anyone. Private variables, only accessible to methods defined on the same class as that variable. Protected variables, can be used by any class that is a descendant of the class in any package or any other class in the same package as, the, as that class. Methods, public, anybody can call the method. Private, only be called by other methods defined on that class. And protected works similarly to the variables. Anybody in the package can call it, otherwise that method can only be called by descendants of that class. Okay, this is where I'm gonna stop for today. Just have a couple of quick announcements. Um, MP1 is due at five. Good luck finishing up MP1. Um, labs will resume as usual tomorrow. I know we took a week off last week, but we have a cool activity for you guys to work on tomorrow. MP2 will be out tonight. I have office hours from two to three. I'll be in the basement helping out with MP1. Um, I will see you guys on Wednesday.